Hi there booktube, it's Roz and I'm here with a proper scally dandling video. What is that you may ask if you if you don't know me well? Well I've got a, a, a long-term personal project to read a book by an author from every country in the world. It's not a kind of rapid tick box exercise, you know, I'm taking my time looking for books I really want to read and uh, this month I read this. That's The Purple Violet of Ashanto by um, Nishani Andreas, who's a author from Namibia. And that's my 173rd country out of 195, so 22 to go. I expect to make some, some good inroads on those 22 this year, but to the point where I'm, I'm left with micronations like Liechtenstein and San Marino or, or island, um, island nations like Kiribati and Tonga, at which point things will become really slow I think but now in these scally sandals I always try to start by giving a bit of context about the the the, the country that the author comes from um particularly intended for those like me um that uh you know are a long way away from the country in question Namibia and here's my trusty globe here is the continent of Africa um always a good to look at it on a globe because you get a feeling of how much bigger it is than um, Europe say um, and Namibia is here um, on the it has a sort of long Atlantic sea coast and then above it is Angola and Botswana to the east and South Africa below and if you can't see its borders really distinctly on this globe that's because this globe is older than the actual country of Namibia which became a, a, a an independent nation in 1990. It's a you know middling sized sort of place sim similar in size to Pakistan um, for example. Um, one of the interesting things about it is that it's very sparsely populated like Mongolia you know one of the least densely populated countries in the world and that's essentially because there's there's the Namib desert um all down the Atlantic coast and then the Kalahari in the center so um uh, yeah not a, a country able to sustain a big population and there is only actually two and a half million people that live there in somewhere that's you know not that much bigger than France say where there are 64 million gives you a sense um and um uh, what are those two and a half million people living on agriculture mining tourism it's one of the the best places in the world for wildlife tourism um, apparently what about a bit of history so that part of of southern africa um was sort of inhabited from prehistoric times by um uh san uh, people so what used to be called bushmen you know hunter gatherers um, and uh, you know, Damara, Nama sort of pastoralists um, then in the 14th century Bantu peoples um, kind of spread from sort of central Africa um, southwards and and they are now the, the majority population of Namibia, so um, of Ambo, Herero and, 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 and so on. Um, so quite a diverse um, mix um, of peoples and languages um, in what's now the country of Namibia. Late 19th century, what happens? We, we know, don't we? There is the hideous European scramble for Africa, as it was called, where, you know, the European countries sort of vied with each other to, to try and take control of um, the, the countries sort of the sub of sub-Saharan Africa um, in particular and the Germans latched onto and and took over most of what is now Namibia and it became what they what was known as, as, as German Southwest Africa so that was late 19th century um, not without local opposition um, and in fact that led to um, a uh, appalling genocide by the Germans on um, the German colonizers on the um, uh, some of the people the Herero and the the Nama um, the, the Herero were 80% were, were of them were, were wiped out because of you know they were opposing 
the colonizers. First World War, South Africa, um, you know, this kind of moved in on um, uh, uh, what's now Namibia, um, because obviously, you know, Germany was, was you know, they, on the other side, as it were. At the end of the First World War, um, the Treaty of Versailles kind of divvied up Germany's colonial possessions to other nations, and it, it, usually in the form of a mandate. So the idea was was that the the countries sort of uh, took over the administration of those colonies, but were meant to be working towards self determination. Well, South Africa got. Um, what's now Namibia, and you know, uh, self determination and independence was never part of their agenda. Um, let's face it, and um, you know, the League of Nations and the United Nations were unable to enforce that on South Africa, and um, uh, Namibia became part of the apartheid system. Um, Obviously, you know, there were opposition, independence struggles, um, you know, very active, uh, like a number of, of, of um, countries, in, you know, colonised countries in Africa, that, that became a bit of a proxy war for um, the sort of socialist bloc, particularly the Soviet Union in this case, and, um, you know, Western nations and particularly, you know, that gave South Africa their excuse for hanging on to it for dear life. But in 1990, you know, independence struggle was successful and Namibia becomes um, a country in its own right. And it's been relatively stable kind of country since it has a multi-party democ multi democracy and so on. Now, this book was published in 2001 um, and was written um, sort of in the sort of mid to late 90s. So it's a book of of the, the the early period of, of Namibian um, independence as a country, um, and uh, that that sort of it's set in that period as well. So that's very much its flavour. What about the author? So Nishani Andreas uh, was born in 1964, same year as me, as it happens, um, and so under apartheid, her parents worked in fish factories she initially worked in a clothing factory but then she um was able to train as a teacher and at the very end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s around the time of independence she was working in um rural area of northern namibia as a teacher and it's those experiences that that form the inspiration for her book because that it's uh, uh shantu is a um a fictional village in that part of, of, of Namibia. Andreas has said that she always wanted to be a writer, you know, from, from, from childhood really, but she makes the point that writing is not something that was sort of expected or um you know considered really in her in her culture. It wasn't recognized as a, you know, respectable profession or activity um and but she always did you know write in 1994 she got to do some postgraduate study in education in the um uh, at the university of namibia and then uh, started work for um the american peace corps and there she met someone who kind of encouraged her ambitions as a writer and um she Excuse me, I just sort out my recalcitrant scarf. Um, so, yes, that kind of gave her the confidence to go to her sort of piles of notebooks and notes and buy a laptop and, and, and pull things together and write her first novel, which is this. And it she finished it in 1999 and it was published in 2001. So it's interesting to hear what she says about writing this book in newly independent Namibia, because she she says, um, I'm quoting from an interview with her here, that you know writing in the newly independent country, there was an expectation, you know, that anyone who wrote should be writing about great events to glorify the past and the present. But she realised that what she wanted to write about, what she needed to write about, was other things. Travelling in overcrowded minibuses, selling and buying at markets, about sickness, witchcraft, and church 
ordinary things. And I'm so glad that she made that choice because that's that's what really makes this as as a book and and you know one that's absolutely worth worth your time to read. Not that it doesn't have big themes. It, I mean, it does in that um, you know she's writing about being a woman in rural Namibia in a culture and a society that is brutally patriarchal um, uh, and where the economic reality is that sort of younger you know working age men predominantly work away you know in mines and so on and it's the women who are left behind bringing up the children managing the land you know agriculture um, and you know the men come back at intervals and they come back with money then but they may also come back with aids and they may also come back having sort of you know uh well the strains that that puts on relationships i suppose and we get in this book uh, a picture of that rural community um and but we get it through the friendship of two women um two youngish mothers um kaona and ali and we see the beauty of the place where they live and some of the strengths of their community and, um, yeah, culture and so on. But we also see, you know, the real struggle of their lives. Um, and um, the, the novel structure is to kind of focus on the period when um, the very abusive husband of one of these two women, Kona, dies suddenly and unexpectedly and, you know, it's sort of unexplained death, probably heart failure. Um, and the sort of period around his death, the period of mourning, his funeral and the aftermath and how, um, you know, looking at how his family and the village treat Kona, um, who, who's in some way, you know, held responsible for his for his his death um and her one you know real ally is her friend ali in terms of oh and i suppose the other thing to say is that we get flashbacks throughout about how you know they came to know each other and and that the sort of preceding years of their friendship um that we you know we dip in and out of that as well um style of the book is quite straightforward it's simple but I wouldn't say simplistic um it, she has a lot of empathy for her characters particularly the women characters but not exclusively um certainly in in Ali and her husband Michael we have a a, a kind of a, a perhaps a more optimistic view of what what sort of uh, marriages in modern Namibia kind of can can and should become in 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 Andreas's eyes um so yes it, it's it's rich in detail uh, poetic in places but generally you know written in quite a sort of yeah straightforward almost sort of naive fashion is written in English, which is actually the official um, the official language of Namibia, it's, a, it's say, a country of many languages, and you know they opted for English as the official language. But we also get a really good sprinkling in the book of um, Oshiwambo, which is the most common first language of, of, of Namibians. Um, about I don't know, fifty six percent of the population speak it, and that enriches the book without distancing the reader because you know we get translations we get a glossary you know so we're, it's, we're sort of you know it's part of of the 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 color and vibrancy i suppose of the novel um i would say and in fact no nishani andreas says herself that she set out to be honest and realistic in this book and um she said that it was really important to her to do that without but without being insensitive or insulting to her own culture and uh, I really appreciated the way you know she achieves that it, it was reasonably well received in Namibia when it came out and but as she says you know writing was still not you know it's not really a 
a career option there. She continued to write, um, but sadly she died um, less than 10 years after um, this was published. Um, what a lost opportunity, um, you know, lung cancer, tragic. And, you know, I'm really sad that we, 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 we haven't got more books, you know, published by Andreas. Um, I suppose what I hope for in a kind of scally dandling read is that it will give me some kind of um that it will be a rewarding reading experience but it will also give me some kind of insight i suppose into um experiences or a, a culture a place that is that is distant from my own is not my own and you know this this novel absolutely delivers that in spades it really does um, you know, I now know, you know, what what a what a homestead um looks and feels like in a, you know, rural Namibia. I, I know the you know, how the women work together sometimes to um help each other in agriculture, but also, you know, how you know, witchcraft, both witchcraft and, um, or accusations of witchcraft and um the church are used to kind of oppress women. You know, it, all of that, all of that. One thing I would say, though, is that what novels like this also give me is that sense of the commonality of our experience across the world. You know, um, abusive relationships and um, tricky kind of relationships with your in-laws, maybe, or people behaving really badly at funerals and, um, you know, appallingly over property after a death. You know, that that's, you know, a kind of... They're, they're, they're kind of quite universal experiences, I think. Um, so this is absolutely a book that I would recommend. It's not it's not a book that's going to kind of knock your socks off with its literary quality, but it's it's um, but equally it's not a struggle to read. You know, it's it, it's 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 well written, consistently written. And I found it both rewarding and moving. And I'll be back with another Scully Dandel relatively soon, I hope.